Hello, it's Keith here, and this is lesson 29 of the platform specific series of my Z80 program tutorials. Now, we've been looking over the last few weeks at hardware detection and bank switching on various systems, and today we're going to look at the last systems for a while on that subject. So, today we're going to look at the Game Boy, the Game Boy Color, the Master System, and the Game Gear, and we're going to see how to detect the hardware where appropriate and how to switch in RAM and ROM banks on those systems. We will be coming back to this topic later because I'm planning to introduce some more obscure systems like the computer's links at a later date, but for now this is going to mean the end of this series and we're going to move on to another topic in the future. So what is there to know about these systems? Well of course as I've said many times the most important thing to know is the Game Boy and the Game Boy Color are virtually the same system as are the Sega Master System and the Sega Game Gear. So with very little exception, what I'm talking about today will be generic between those pairs of systems. So let's start with the Game Boy and the Game Boy Color. Well, what options do we have on these systems? Well, the first thing is we will want to detect a Game Boy Color on a regular Game Boy system because we may want to have a game that works with both systems. And there were plenty of cartridges in the early days of the Game Boy Color that did work on both systems, just turning on the color on the more advanced system. So how do we do that? Well, one way that apparently does reliably work is you can just check the accumulator on the load up and see if the accumulator has the value hexadecimal 11, then it's a Game Boy Color. And if it doesn't, then it's a regular Game Boy. It seems rather strange, but I'm told it's reliable. Anyway, we're not going to be doing that today. We're actually going to try switching on the Game Boy Color RAM and detecting if that RAM bank has switched in in exactly the same way as we did on the other systems like the Amstrad CPC, because I tend to prefer that as a more reliable way Try to turn on the exclusive hardware. If it doesn't work, you know you've not got that exclusive hardware. And another reason we may want to detect the Game Boy Color is the Game Boy Color has an 8 megahertz processor, twice the speed of the regular Game Boy. And we were going to look at today how to turn that on as well. Now, another thing the Game Boy Color has is extra memory. The original Game Boy had a fairly decent 8 kilobytes of memory, but um, the Game Boy Color actually had 32 kilobytes. So Again, we may want to use that extra memory, although if we're supporting both systems, it could be tricky. But we're going to again look at how to use that extra memory. If you want extra memory on a non-Game Boy Color, you do have another option. The cartridges themselves can have their own built-in memory, and they can have 32 kilobytes as well. So if you want to have extra memory and not require the Game Boy Color, that's another option for you as well as RAM. The Game Boy cartridges can have quite exceptional amounts of ROM, I believe up to a 512 kilobytes or more, and we can page that in as well. The only exception is, I believe it's not possible to have very large amounts of ROM and very large amounts of extra RAM in the cartridge, so it tends to be you can have a big ROM cartridge or a modest ROM and RAM cartridge, but even when I'm saying modest, it's still many, many kilobytes, so it's not too much of a problem for regular games. So we're going to look at all of those things on the Game Boy. So, well, the first thing to know is about the ports that we're going to need for the Game Boy Color. So we've got a special port for accessing the CPU. We've got a special port for banking in the RAM. But when we want to access the CPU, we also need to do a strange command onto the joystick port and turn the interrupts off. So we're going to need to know those as well. So let's get on to how to use these extra features. Well, if you want to use the Game Boy Color RAM, it's really, really easy. All you do is you send a number from 1 to 7 to the RAM port FF70, and this will page in that bank number into the D000 to DFFF range. So you can page that extra memory into that space, and that will give you access to the extra banks of memory into that address range. But there's an important thing to notice. This gives you access to the extra seven banks of memory within the Game Boy Color. However, if you try to page in bank zero, it will give the same effect as bank one, because there effectively is no bank zero to the extra memory. That would kind of be the internal regular Game Boy memory. So that doesn't have any effect. So don't be surprised if you try and do that and it doesn't do what you expect. Now, when it comes to using ROM, we're writing to the cartridge memory. Now, of course, the cartridge memory is read-only memory, but because the cartridge is listening, it will detect we want to switch our banks and the cartridge will switch the banks accordingly. So basically, to access a ROM bank, we just write the ROM bank number we want to page in to the address 2000. And you can imagine your ROM file as being 16 kilobyte chunks, and the ROM number will be one of those 16 kilobyte chunks. So you just keep making your ROM bigger. You don't need to do any special information in the ROM, apart from having the appropriate header to tell the um, emulators that the ROM has the extra hardware. But before we can use that function, we do need to do one other thing. We need to write a zero to address 6000 
if we want to have a very large ROM that has no RAM inside it. And this tells the swapper what configuration our ROM and RAM is within that cartridge. As I said though, we can have extra RAM as well. And to be honest, the functionality is almost exactly the same. Rather than writing a zero to tell it we've got a large cartridge, we need to write a one, and this tells it that we have RAM as well. So the cartridge is slightly smaller, but we have the RAM as an extra feature. Then we need to turn on the RAM. We write 0A to address 0. A very strange address there, but that's what we do. We can turn it off by writing a 0 to that address, and that will turn the RAM on and off. Now, all we need to do to actually select the bank of RAM is we write a 0 to a 3 to the address 4000, and that will address in 8 kilobytes of memory into the A000 to B FFF range of the system memory, which was typically free. So that's how we can gain access to our cartridge memory. One important thing to notice though is um, apparently if the player turns off the game halfway through, the RAM can get corrupted. And because this is usually battery backed up RAM, that could be a problem if your game settings get lost. So it's widely recommended to turn off the RAM when you don't need it by writing that zero to memory address 0000. So that's pretty straightforward. And we're gonna have a look at an example of doing this in just a moment, but um, what about the turbo mode? Well, of course, if we've got a Game Boy Color, we can turn on this turbo mode. All we need to do, write a zero to FFFF, the memory address, that will turn off interrupts. Then we write a special combination of bits, which is effectively 48 here, and that will set the joystick bits accordingly. Now, to my knowledge, this is just a kind of marker to the internal hardware. It doesn't have any effect on the joystick, but we have to do that. Then we have to send a one to port FF4D, which is described as the prepare switch for the CPU. We can check the current state of the CPU by reading the top bit of that port, but we have to write a one to initialize the CPU to change speed. But the CPU won't immediately change speed. We have to do a stop command first, which halts the processor. When processing resumes immediately afterwards, it will now be in turbo mode. So that's the way we can turn our CPU to turbo on the Game Boy Color. Now, I've tried this and as far as I can tell, it doesn't have any negative effects on the Game Boy, but I suppose, generally speaking, you really wanna check if you've got a Game Boy Color before you try and do this, just in case. So that's the theory of that one. What about the Sega Master System and the Game Gear? Well, the Master System and the Game Gear have very much the same functions without the turbo mode, but um, we can have memory inside the cartridge and we can have ROM inside the cartridge. The ROM banking is more advanced. It's a bit more like the enterprise style banking. The memory range of the Z80 is effectively split into four chunks and we can flip three of those chunks to any one of the ROM banks within the cartridge. Again, we just need to make our cartridge bigger by adding more and more 16 kilobyte chunks. And then we page them in just by writing a number to one of these hardware mapped registers and that will change the relative bank matching to that register. So very straightforward to paging in extra ROM there. We can also access memory, however, what we can do is we can write to FFFC and there are special combinations of bits which we need to write to do that. Effectively, we can use these combinations here to page in RAM Bank 0 or RAM Bank 1 and they will be accessible from the 8 triple zero range to be FFF. So effectively, we have up to 32 kilobytes of memory that can be accessed within that range. Now, I'm a bit confused here because I, when I tried this and when I read the documentation, it was claimed that it's possible to use this bit combination here to actually access an extra bank of RAM that would page in into the shadow memory range or the regular memory range. And it, it said you had to turn off the internal memory and I tried it as hard as I could and I could not get it to work. So my suspicion is the documentation seemed to imply no commercially available cartridges actually use this function. So um, I'm wondering if the emulators don't support it. Anyway, suffice to say, I'm not gonna be doing it in today's tutorials because I couldn't get it to work. So it's not documented here because I couldn't get it to work. So if I figure it out, I'll add it to the documentation. But for now, we're just gonna ignore it because to be honest with the internal memory in the Sega Master System and being able to pay extra memory into the ROM space, probably don't need it anyway. So we'll just do without it for now. So that's the theory out of the way. Let's have a look at today's example code. So we're basically using the same code as before, but we've got some special additions for today. So we're doing our guess hardware version as usual, and we're gonna output the value of that to the monitor. We're gonna turn on the fast CPU on the Game Boy Color, though honestly it won't make much difference, but we wanna try it out. And then we're gonna page in some RAM banks on the SMS cartridge, and then and we're gonna test those, and then we're going to do the basic tests as well on the Sega Master System. On the Game Boy, we're gonna try the Game Boy cartridge RAM bank here, 
We're also going to try the ROM banks here, and so that will give a pretty good test of the system. Well, let's have a look at the actual source code we're going to be using. We've seen some of it already because there were screenshots of it in those examples on the website. But um, basically, this is the code to actually turn on the fast CPU. And the bank swapping is very straightforward. We just, to get the Game Boy Color RAM bank, we just write a RAM bank number to FF70 here. To get a cartridge RAM bank, we just write the initialization commands here and we write the bank number to 4000 and to get cartridge ROM we need to write a 0 to 6000 and the bank number to 2000. So no, nothing too special there, we're just using the banking and we're doing it in a way that is pretty compatible with our previous stuff. Now when it comes to get hardware version, we're doing pretty much the same test as we did before, we're writing a hexadecimal 69 to a known position in memory, turning on the Game Boy Color RAM we're then flipping the bits in that memory location, turning off the Game Boy Color RAM and seeing if the byte was changed. If the byte wasn't changed, the Color RAM paged incorrectly. If it was changed, then we don't have that Color RAM. It didn't page incorrectly, so we must be on a regular Game Boy. And we're going to change D accordingly there. We're not going to test for internal cartridge memory because that's something you have to actually define in the header. So you, this shouldn't be something your game ever needs to detect. And on the Sega Master System, we're actually going to cheat. We're not really going to detect hardware at all. So what we're going to do is we're going to just set the top bit to a zero for the Master System and a one for the Game Gear. Now, there's no real reason you should ever want to use this because there's no place where a cartridge would be swapped into both machines. I know there's a converter for the Game Gear, but I don't think it's even possible for a yeah. Master System game to detect it's plugged into a Game Gear, and it's certainly not realistic, so it's far more efficient for us to use compiler-based directors, but just for completeness, I've put a marker in here just in case you want parts of your code to work differently dynamically rather than with recompilation, but of course, these compiler directives are far more efficient memory-wise, so you, you really shouldn't, but I just wanted to put it in there. And then here's our Sega Master System bank swapper again. We've got a cartridge bank option here for accessing the memory banks. And we've got just our regular ROM bank function here, which is going to be what we're going to be testing as well today. OK, so that's the code and the theory. Let's actually see this in action then. So you here you can see we've just dumped the monitor to the memory. And then you can see now we've actually shown the first ROM bank here. And then we've paged in the RAM. We've written some different values to the RAM here. So you can see the two banks of RAM. And then we're switching back to the ROM. This is the internal cartridge memory for the actual code. This is the second bank. This is the third bank here. And if I look at the bottom of the code here, you can see we're padding out the cartridge here with a bunch of dummy data here so that we can see those extra banks being paged in. So you can see there, we can, we're clearly able to page in ROM banks and page in alternate RAM banks. So there we go. So what about the Game Boy Color? Well, you can see we've managed to detect our Game Boy Color here because we've got a 1 here. We'll have a 0 on a regular Game Boy. And here you can see we've been able to write a 69 into the extra memory within the cartridge here. And also we've been able to page in extra banks of cartridge memory on the Game Boy Color just like we did on the Master System and Game Gear. So this means our games are not limited to just the 16 kilobytes of basic cartridge memory. And let's try it again on the Game Boy. Well, you can see now we've got a zero here, so we've detected a regular Game Boy. But you can see we are still able to use this extra memory here and bank in our extra ROM because this is the memory within the cartridge, not the memory within the Game Boy Color. Of course, there's no reason we can't use the Game Boy Color memory only on the Game Boy Color, but that would mean we aren't supporting the Game Boy at all. So unless you want to use the turbo mode and the extra features of the tile map, you'd probably be better off using the cartridge memory before you resorted to using the Game Boy Color exclusive internal console memory. But anyway, there we go. So that's all I wanted to cover today on this subject. We've done a lot of stuff on hardware detection and bank switching now. So we're going to move on to another topic next week. I've still got lots of stuff I'm planning to cover with regards to these systems. We're still going to do hardware sprites and um, tile map stuff with regards to shifting the screen. We're going to look at disk loading on some of the systems with disks. So we're, we're nowhere near finished yet. But now we've, it's time to move on from hardware detection and memory bank swapping. I hope you've enjoyed today's lesson. Please also bear in mind I'm currently doing the Grime 6502 series, so please check out the Grime series if you're interested in more programming with the Z80 6502 or 68000. Anyway, thanks for watching today and goodbye.